President Kington, esteemed professors and Grinelli and alumni, proud families and happy friends, and especially those of you in cap and gown, the class of 2019. It's an honor to be here, truly an honor to be here on this special non-rainy day. You see, you are like me. You are curious and you wonder and you imagine what it might be for you and the world. You question and you don't accept generalizations. You ponder the elusive nature of ethics and morality and whether they are universal. You have so much of the world in your mind, so much suffering to think about, and where do you begin? You and I know that stories have many beginnings and that they don't end with simple resolutions, good or bad. Something else happens, and you are part of that something. You have always been part of that story. Given that you are independent thinkers, I'm not going to be giving you any all-encompassing advice or homilies or ancient Chinese wisdom. Instead, I'm going to do what writers do best. I'm going to talk about myself. <laughs> and I'm going to do this because I found there's this amazing thing that happens when you write a story that is deeply personal, true to yourself. You often find that people resonate they find resonance in that story. They find that the deep and personal thoughts that I have are the same ones that they have. And so uh, let me begin by saying to you, confessing to you that I never dreamed of becoming a writer. In fact, I knew by the age of six what I would become. And that is because a lady came to my school, a very well-dressed lady, and she gave me a test. And then she said to my parents that I would become a doctor. My parents were delighted to tell me that. In fact, they said I would not only become a doctor, I would become a concert pianist because I was taking piano lessons. Now imagine it, 8 a.m. surgery, 8 p.m. concert. <laughs> well, at that young age of six, I had fear clutching me because I was worried that I wasn't smart enough, and this fear that I wasn't smart enough would haunt me for the rest of my childhood and into my adulthood. Well, I never dreamed of becoming a writer. I actually did dream of becoming an artist. I was told I would, had quite a good eye. I could draw a cat that looked like a cat. And, um, but then I had an art teacher who wrote this on my report card when I was in junior high. He said, has admirable drawing skills, but lacks imagination necessary to a deeper creative level. Lacks imagination, creativity, and deep depth. And those are the worst things you could say to a writer. I had other indications that I was, um, I was not, I had limitations, for example, on, the SAT test in the English portion, I scored in the 400s, which is not exactly a good indication that I'd be standing before you today as your author. Um, and the odd thing is that I got a 700 or in the 700s on Spanish, so go figure. I also did a lot better in math, and so maybe the well-dressed lady was right. I started college, Linfield College, as a pre-med student. Now the problem was, I didn't really like bi biology or chemistry or any of those other classes. And with disinterest, I was, well, failure was looming. And that was hastened by love. Because when I was a freshman, I fell in love with a boy I met on a blind date. And I failed to study for my final exams. And so as I recall, I got something like a, a C in biology, a, D in chemistry and F in calculus. Well, these were terrible facts that I had to convey to my mother. My father had already died, so she was the only one I had to tell that I would not become a doctor. Shortly after that, 
and I told her I would also not become a concert pianist, that I had quit my piano lessons. There would be no applause, no curtsy bow, no tears of parental pride. I instead chose something that I loved to do. I loved to read. And I decided that despite what the SAT tests had said, I would become an English major. And that was also because a professor, a wonderful professor of English, told me that he liked my essays. I didn't think about what I would do with the English major. I could wait three more years. Along the way, I read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and I fell in love with language. I fell in love with the texture of words and when they were used and the people who used them. And so I ended up taking another major in linguistics. I got my degree in English and linguistics, and then I delayed things about my career by taking a master's in linguistics, and then to delay it even further, I enrolled in a PhD program at UC Berkeley. It was a very competitive school, and within a year, I felt I was the worst student, and they would soon kick me out. And before that could happen, I decided that I would quit. Now I faced a huge existential crisis. Who was I going to be? I was the blank and the fill in the blank. My very self was at stake. Before I could continue with this despair and gloom, however, something else eclipsed that far more serious. One of our best friends was murdered in a robbery. He was somebody who was a computer sciences major and he had wanted to make innovative devices for people with disabilities. I had wanted to be who knows what. But I made a vow that I would do something meaningful with my life. And so I answered an ad for a language develop development specialist for programs that serve children with developmental disabilities, birth to five, and their parents. I had two courses in language acquisition. I had never taken a course in disabilities, in intervention, in education. I didn't like children. I thought that they screamed a lot, they pooped, they threw food from their high chairs. But I started that job with this commitment. And in the beginning, I tried to show how smart I was so people would think I was worthy of the job. But one day, a woman said to me, a mother, she could barely speak English, and she said to me, you're so smart. And I felt so stupid. And from then on, what I did was I listened. I listened to those parents talk about love and their hopes and their losses and their hopes again. And when they cried, I cried with them. I loved that job. I loved those kids. Their lives were individual stories, and I had become interwoven with it. But then a terrible thing happened. I was promoted. And I became a project manager. Now, I was an administrator. I had no contact with kids and parents, really. And I found that I also had differences of opinion with my bosses about ethics. And so I found myself once again quitting something. I left. And now again, I was nobody. Who would I become? I had left not only my job, but the profession. I found a job, a temporary job, I thought, as a copywriter for a small PR agency. I was writing things like direct mail, which is like today's spam. I was writing PR releases for questionable companies and products. But I was doing this because the guy said that I was a partner. I had 20% interest in the company. Well, I found out that wasn't true. And when I did, I told him I was quitting and I was going to go off and become a freelance writer on my own. And he gave me these words of encouragement. Fat chance, you'll be lucky if you make a dime. I was so angry at that his condescension that I took his words as a challenge. And within a few months, I was making a lot of dimes. 
I had a client roster that included AT&T and IBM. I was writing brochures and speeches and educational materials and newsletters for those companies. I was a success. Those people really needed me. I was billing 90 hours a week. They said I was irreplaceable. I doubled my fee. They still loved me. But you know, in the morning I would go down to my office and I would ask myself, is this what I'm going to be doing 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And then I would turn on my computer and begin to work. I was in a terrible crisis, even though I was a success, so to speak. A friend suggested that I go to see a psychiatrist for my workaholism. You know, if you didn't like to work, but you couldn't stop, there was something wrong. So I saw this therapist, even though it went against my nature as a bargain hunter, to pay $200 to have somebody listen to me complain. I didn't have to pay for it long because one day, you know, a guy never said anything except, you know, time's up, talk to you next week. But I found out why he never said anything. He fell asleep. I didn't say anything the first time. I was so embarrassed for him. But the third time, I demanded a refund and I quit therapy. This is becoming a problem for me. I was quitting everything. Well, I decided to do something on my own, to make my own decision on what I should do with my life. And I decided that I would only work 50 billable hours a week. And in all my spare time, I would start writing fiction because I had always loved to read. I took a writer's workshop. And there, it felt as if my mind and my soul had been plugged into an electrical socket and the dormant parts of me had come alive. I found that in writing, the subterfuge of fiction had led me to deep emotional truths. And this was a high I had never experienced in my life. It was something I wanted to feel over and over again. And it didn't matter if I ever made money. This is what I was going to do no matter what. Of course, I would still continue to do the business writing because after all, I was pragmatic. I had to make a living and everybody knows you wouldn't make a dime writing fiction. Well, as you all know, I got published. But it didn't happen the way that you think because I never asked for this. I never dreamed it. I didn't seek an agent. I didn't seek a publisher. It just happened. It was like winning the lottery when I had never bought a ticket. It was, in fact, frightening. Because you think that you're in control of your own destiny, your own future, and then something simply happens out of your control. It took me approximately six months before I accepted what happened. And every day, it's been 30 years now, every day I wake up, and I am so grateful for the life that I have. It's a life that involves continuing to write stories and finding those emotional truths. And it also includes responsibilities for a writer being in the public eye to speak out about pain and suffering and injustice. I told you that there are stories and they don't have endings, they continue. And I want to tell you a bit about what some of those endings were. I mentioned to you that there was a teacher who told me I had no creativity. Well, I became friends with him. And recently I started drawing and I sent him a picture of a bird and I reminded him of what he said to me. I told you that I hated my piano lessons and I quit. Music is a huge part of my life. We support the symphony, the opera, jazz, piano. I even wrote libretto for an opera. I told you that I didn't do well on the SAT. My work is now used in the advanced placement SAT. <laughs> I told you that I flunked because I fell in love with a boy on a blind date. I married that boy and we have been together for 49 years. I told you that I hated science and today I read more science books than I do fiction. I go out with my friends on field research studies and I look for leeches and lichen 
and even poisonous snakes. I found the, te the woman who gave me the test. I did, I Googled her. And I found out that test did not say that I was going to be a doctor. It had nothing to do with whether I was smart. She had tested me and 49 children because we were early readers and she wanted to find out how we learned to read and whether this was harmful or helpful later in learning. I was shocked because this had affected my self-esteem my entire life. I told her what my parents had said and she said they were wrong to say that. You love to read and that's why you became a writer. And I cried when she said that. As I said, the stories continue and you are part of why that continues. I am so happy you are here in this world for our future. Thank you.